You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Welcome to the Soul Forge, a place of silent mystery, quiet contemplation, and outright mayhem. Join your host, Sean Vanderloo, as he guides you through the adventures of living. Together, we'll talk about life and love, sex and dating, joy and heartache, memories and loss, and so much more. Don't worry, it's not nearly as pretentious as it sounds. Get ready for life, the universe, and everything on the Soul Forge. Soulforgepodcast.com. Hello, and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, the Monster, back to give you my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 1. And joining me today is going to be Tony from CinemaViewFinder.com, who has been on previous uh, podcasts, which we talked about Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek in general. So... Uh, as a note of concern, there is going to be a discrepancy about the audio, at least initially at the beginning, uh, up to the, about the nine minute mark, and then it improves significantly. Why? Because I'm an idiot. That's why. I recorded on the wrong mic. But in any case, you can still hear us, just not great quality at the beginning, but I assure you, it will get better. All right, so let's get started. So before we get started about the actual episode, I wanted to talk about the Star Trek shorts, the four of them. Um, I already kind of gave a review on a previous podcast. I'm curious to get your take about what did you think about them. Well, I feel like it's hard to uh, hard to know what kind of impact they're having. Because I have a feeling that they're foreshadowing things that we're going to see later this season. And so until that happens, I feel like right now they're just kind of isolated, little interesting, quick takes on Star Trek. What, what I did like was that they, they did take advantage of that short time to show you how malleable Trek is and how... Trek can be everything from scary to funny to suspenseful, and and I like that they used every episode to explore different aspects of you know what Trek can be. Um, easily, I think the best one was Calypso. I don't know which one you liked the best. Uh, it was one of my favorites. It definitely was. Yeah. Um, but the, I think, run, Runaway, the one with Tilly, um, was problematic because it, it tried to force Tilly to be very Tilly. And when I looked at the first episode, and we'll talk about that in a moment, um, the way Tilly was in that first episode, that's the kind of natural Tilly I wanted. And this short episode just kind of let's make it more upgraded or more ramped up, and that's what kind of kind of ticked me off. Like when she found out that uh, the alien was a queen, and she dropped, you know, oh shit, you know, that kind of thing, and just kind of freaked out. I'm like, yeah, but she, I don't think she would have done that normally. I think she would have had a moment, but not drop the oh shit kind of reflective of that oh f- you know uh the fuck moment that she dropped in season one so i think well, it's one of those things that uh i feel like a lot of shows make this mistake that they have a fan favorite character and then they decide to make that character like the star of the show for whatever reason and, and i'm like 
you know, Fonzie's cool when he's supporting Richie, but I don't want to see a whole show about Fonzie because that's boring. You know? yeah. <laughs> and and that's basically what happened here, you know, with Tilly. Like, just, but the one saving grace is that at least they only did that for 15 minutes. Right, it exactly. Been a Forty-five minute show would have been worse. <laughs> you know? I totally agree. That was the one saving grace, and then and again. I love the actress. I love that character. But this is kind of like, as I mentioned, it was fan fiction uh, like on a level that I would have written, you know, and it's garbage. It really felt like, really, you wrote this and you produced this kind of level of story. It's, it, it, to me, you could have done so much more. And thankfully, in the other three shorts i think they did a better idea of what the shorts could be because if you remember i don't know if you remember um like shows like heroes when it was gone for a season it would do like many like webisodes to kind of get you ready for the you know, the premiere well you know other shows have done that too and not all always for that great but here i think like as you mentioned about the level of what trek could be i think more than anything else, Calypso, I think, kind of encapsulate the whole feeling of, oh my god, this is a grand story. For such a short time, it is telling a grand story. Well, what was amazing about that episode was that they, <coughs> without having one single character from the show... Other than the ship. For the ship itself. Yeah. Um, and so that... That plus the fact that it was set so far in the future made it so epic. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed with the fact that it was that epic in this really condensed amount of time, you know, like 16 minutes or something like that. And so, and the, and the, and the kind of things that they were hinting at were interesting because, you know, I don't know if you caught it, but like when he referred to the enemies he was running away from the the name that he said was like a mangled version of the federation so somehow in the future the federation is in some kind of war with that guy's people um mm. and i found that interesting you know like especially if they're going to touch on this again at some point you know right now refresh my memory um would this have been taking place in the Mirror Mirror universe? It didn't, no, it didn't seem like it would. Right, and there's no, there was no indication on the ship, like logos or anything like that, uh, that it belonged. No, and especially because they don't, I think the Mirror Universe doesn't use the term Federation, they use the term The, the term Empire, yeah. Federation, right, so. okay. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think it leaves off, uh, it has more questions than it gives you at least what the answers are for. And that's the kind of speculation that it's kind of really, that's amazing to do that in a short uh, amount of time to kind of tell you stories. I'm like, one, what the hell happened to the crew, you know, and it's been a thousand years and it's still there waiting. And how did it self, you know, evolve to, uh, AI to the point where it is self-aware. I mean, it's just one of those things that I'm just I find fascinating to delve into and kind of pick apart just all the different aspects of that short little episode. Yeah, I mean, but also aside from all of that, then there's the aspect of it that's sci-fi, which is like you said, the evolving artificial intelligence of this thing, and then there's the part of it that's what I always find cool about Star Trek is that it's a it's a romance, and you're like, okay, Star Trek can do a romance. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Star Trek can do comedy, Star Trek can do romance, Star Trek can do horror. You know, like so. Uh, so yeah, I really loved that episode, and it was written by a Pulitzer Prize winner. So I thought, great, you know, we need more of that. Like, I, I totally agree. Uh, the next one, the brightest star. This is the backstory for Saru, which um, Saru does mention his sister in the first episode. So I'm kind of glad that 
I actually saw this in reference to that one quick line that Suru says about, you know, do you have any siblings? And he says, I do, but there's too much terrain to cover or something to that effect. So I, what are your thoughts about this? Because I was kind of conflicted. Um, I mean, I don't tend to like origin stories so much because I like to hear about those things, like like little implied things about the character, rather than see it illustrated in perfect detail. But the one thing I loved about the show was when he meets uh, Captain Giorgio, and and I felt like that was like a great way to bring that character back and show you, you know, how, what her um, part was in discovering that planet and, you know, recruiting Saru and it was just, that part was interesting to me. So what kind of hints would you go for? Like, like as far as character development, what you wanted to know, like, like Star Trek Five, like oh, by the way, Spock had a half brother named Cybok, and that kind of reveal, or no, just... I just mean that you know, like I just mean that I like a character to be a little mysterious, and for us to just find out about them slowly, rather than oh, and here's how I became a Starfleet officer, you know, like <laughs> I just think that that's a little dorky, you know, like. Like, we didn't find out who Picard really was until that episode, Tapestry, and that episode did not happen until, like, the sixth season, you know? Um, and even then, it was only covering a little sliver of that character. Right. So I feel like I'd prefer something like that over this, you know, scene where they just tell you the whole everything you need to know about Saru, you know, like, Right. Well, this also reminded me, um, I mentioned this before, that in Farscape, the pilot also had kind of similar yearning to go to the stars, but he would have to be um, matched with uh, a living ship in order for that to happen. So it not exactly the exact same way, but it just reminded me of that Farscape episode. So I'm like, I, I guess my question was, because Saru was able to construct this communication device, is that enough to qualify an alien being who is not in a pre is, is not even in a, in a pre warp civil you know, he is in a pre warp civilization, but to pluck them out, considering the bigger picture, you know, like it could upset the balance. I mean, is it right that? Georgiou picked him out, so to speak, because he would have corrupted everybody else of what he found. Do you think that was the reason why she said, you know, you have to go with me now? I mean, I'm going to say that they eventually figured out that, no, that was not a good enough reason, because later on, that's how Data got in trouble in Pen Pals. Right. When he, when that girl reached out for somebody and he answered her call. So, but I mean, this is the early days of Starfleet. They're more, a little more cowboy. Well, so. I, I would have done that like in Enterprise. Enterprise, yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff that they would have done. But with George U, I mean, this is kind of like a little bit more president. They shouldn't have done that already. So No, they still would have done that. Captain Kirk broke rules all the time. You know that. No, I know, I know, but still. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, so the last one, The Escape Artist. So we get the return of Harry Mudd. What were your thoughts about him? Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a cute episode, but, you know, Harry Mudd, I liked Harry Mudd in the original series a lot, but I don't love... Uh, Rain Wilson that much, you know? So a little Harry Mudd goes a long way. And it's like, <laughs> I didn't need to see him for the third time already. Like, they need to space him out a little bit more. Right. You know? 
I, my I, opinion. Yeah. But. No, I agree. Um, because it's not as if Star Trek is always about this one character reoccurring. I mean, he was on there twice, and now technically he is now on three times on Star Trek uh, for this series. But yeah, and, and you know what? The second time he came out, I felt like that was one of the better episodes of yes. season one. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of would like to let it rest for a little bit on that because I was like, okay, that was a good note to leave that character on. And and then bringing him back for this felt a little bit like, uh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, for here, I felt that's Harry Mudd. At least this generation's Harry Mudd. And I was fine with that. This is the kind of lovable scoundrel that, you know, he's diabolical, he's scheming, but he's a, he's a lovable guy, you know, and I thought this is the better version of Harry Mudd that we saw since, like, the first one, and where he was in Klingon prison. Um, so I'm like, I, I appreciate that more so than the early versions of what Rain Wilson did. Right. I get you. So, so on that note, uh, out of the four, you said Calypso is the best one? Yeah, that's not what I think. Yeah. Okay. So I would put Calypso also high on my list, as well as uh, the Escape Artist. Uh, the bright star, the brightest star is half, whereas Runaway is pretty much not at all what I would want to watch again. Yeah, I think Runaway ranked a little bit higher for me just because I like Tilly, but... Yeah, I mean, I like Tilly a lot, as I mentioned, but not this episode. I was really disappointed, so... Right. All right, so let's get started and talk about, finally, Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 1, called Brother. So, your initial takeaway for this episode... Um, I liked it. I, I thought, I thought it was a great way to start off the season because it seems like now they're veering the show more towards what we expect Star Trek to be like and less, uh, less dark than the first season was, you know? Um, and the effects on this episode were amazing like I felt like this is a better looking movie than some of the movies they've made you know like yeah so you know between all of that and then the appearance of Captain Pike and how well they used him and integrated him into the cast like I I just really like this episode a lot yeah I I for all the problems that I had for season one um, it took me a very long time to get to the point that, okay, I can accept the Klingons looking that way. I can accept certain technologies being more advanced. Um, and even to the point where the last shot of the Enterprise, the way it looked, this is not the Enterprise that we know, but this is just an updated upgraded version so from this point on and we talked about this is that basically they're retconning that universe so that it's more like the movies and it it looks just like the movies and it's fantastic so i have no problems as long as they do this i'm in there i'm finally back into star trek mode the way that i want to be back but the problem lies, um, Alex Kurtzman, um, who originally wanted to direct Star Trek, uh, I think Star Trek Three, but was turned down, and for whatever reason, Paramount did not want him to do that. So this was his version of, all right, J.J., this is my movie, and it has that kind of feel all over it. I don't think from week to week, we can keep up that kind of level of entertainment and excitement from week to week. 
I would love to, for them to see them try as their best, but visually, it is stunning. Um, uh-huh. Everything about this, um, when they going down to the asteroid, um, was a much better sequence than what we saw with uh, Burnham in the first season when she was heading towards what we find out as a Klingon ship. Uh-huh. It is so much better with the interaction with the cast. Um, Tilly is the Tilly that we want. And like even at the like the last moment when the ship um, was able to pull in an asteroid and she yells out, Come on, people, that's basic math, you know. And she was that's what you wouldn't want to say. You don't have to go say fuck yeah or you know, and get all excited. She used it cleverly and with her tilliness, it made it adorable, you know, that she was able to kind of have that enthusiasm in a very clever and smart way. So they did a lot of right things. Overall, Anson Mount as Pike, freaking fantastic. I'm glad to hear him speak after that abominable series of the Inhumans in which he couldn't, you know. He has a good presence. I I love, you know, his interactions. Even when Burnham was kind of giving him some lip, you know, he's like, I don't want here, I don't mind uh, descending opinions, I just want to hear solutions. And, you know, it's like, with Burnham throwing back at him, we would never, you know, let someone from the Federation um, go without us fighting for them. And he says, I'm right there with you. So he kind of finally gets an understanding with Burnham. And I think for once, I actually like Burnham in this one episode. I could not have cared for her most of all last season. But at least here, there's a little bit uh, a better ease about getting into that character. So I'm kind of happy about that. You know what was clumsy about the show, though? <clears throat> the um, the way they shoehorned Spock into the episode yeah. seemed a little bit um, off. Like, like, they introduce him earlier in the episode as a kid so that you get uh, a little foreshadowing that they're going to talk about him later in the episode. But then later in the episode, the whole story about the asteroid ends. Like right there, that episode should have ended and the rest of the episode should have started the next episode because the tonal shift seemed like it was not of a piece with the rest of the show. And so, I don't know. I feel like that was a mistake, but you know, it's a mistake that it could be forgiven if this were streamed the same way a Netflix show is streamed, where they give you all 13 episodes at the same time. Right. But the fact that this is one of those week to week things, like they really should have just waited till the next episode to bring that in. No, I, I totally agree. Um, even with that, the and this is just nitpicking. Again, I, I love the episode for what it gave me. But when you look back and re-examine it, it did stick out to me about even the the housing that they brought Burnham to seemed a little too Terran. Not really Vulcan enough that we've seen in past uh, incarnations of their dwellings. It just seems like it looks like any nice modern home. I'm like, we don't have the budget to get a home to make it look fancy like in a cave or Adobe effects. Nothing. It just like, okay. And it just kind of felt weird about Spock being uh, kind of not a brat, but, you know, kind of not really welcoming. Um yeah, Braddy towards his sister. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, this is the first we even find out he had a sister, so... Well, and the other thing, too, that kind of pisses me off, and again, only if you know or have read the Star Trek Discovery novel called Desperate Hours, you would know that 
when Giorgio was still alive, she was on board the Enterprise with Captain Pike, with Spock, and Burnham was there. So they already met before. So I'm kind of ticked that that happened. But, you know, it, it's the writers who get to choose and the direction of the showrunner gets to have the final say. So whatever is written yeah, in but pocket is books. That really, is that really something that the show contradicts? Because all they say on the show is that he hasn't, they haven't seen each other in some time. Right? Yeah, but she's never, Pike never acknowledges Burnham. It was as if it's the first time. That's the, that's what I'm saying. So that's the kind of thing. Like, okay, that, that's fine. It, it, it it's one of those things. Like you know, when Disney bought Star Wars and made all those books, the extended universe stuff, just non-canon. None of that exists. Chewbacca is still alive. You know that didn't never happen. That kind of thing. So, but it's like, if you want to have your fans get excited for adventures of discovery you know you can and and pocketbooks did a great job when next generation came out and sometimes they'll say this book takes place between this and this episode or you know whatever this is the event from this happens this is that story that's where i'm kind of cool with that because at least it it's it coincides Whereas here, they started, uh, I think, there's only two other stories, I think. Uh, Desperate Hours and, and another book. I don't think there's another Discovery novel that's out there. But with David Mack, you know, he went to the writers early in season one, asking, you know, what you want me to do about the technology and how it kind of doesn't fit. And he kind of he, he tried to explain it that, you know, certain ships are, are newer than others and you know, he made it all work, but the the outstanding point was that Burnham had met Pike before, and again, that seems to be dismissed. So, eh. it'll be interesting to see. I'm not sure what they're planning, but it'll be interesting to see whether Pike stays on for longer than this one season, because I would think that what would be really cool is that if they end up writing him out of the show by having him injured in the way that we eventually find out. I thought about that too. The original series. Yeah, because we're assuming, because uh, he has the fortune cookie towards the end in the ready room. Something about the cage, and it makes that kind of weird reference. So I'm assuming yeah. the cage episode already happened. So you it could, did. you it could, did. right. Yeah. So possibly, yeah, exactly. You would have an incident in which he gets severely injured and then Spock does the menagerie episode, basically. Um, so if that comes to be, that's cool. But I would love to see maybe a season or two of Pike doing the Enterprise with Spock a couple more seasons and scene number one, which is Rebecca Romaine, stay, uh, not Stamos anymore, she's divorced, but I would love to see that kind of relationship happen more. So, and I know we're going to get other Trek series like with Picard, um, an animated series, um, and then this one, I'm really kind of on the fence here. And that's the one about Section 31. And I wanted to ask you about that. So Michelle Yao, uh, in Season 1, uh, Georgiou was basically the Empress from the alternate uh, Mirror Mirror Universe. So she's brought over, and she's then asked by Section 31 to join them. Here's my thing. There's two points. If you're Section 31, isn't it their creed to kind of like, there is no Section 31? Right? They're working behind the scenes. Right. So why is it that now everyone knows about Section 31? Like, 
in the trailer for the next episode, Giorgio says, you know, I got dropped by Section 31, and Pike was like, oh, whatever. I don't mind. It seems like that should not be a thing that people know about. That's the whole idea about Section I, 31. I think that Discovery, we will learn that Discovery is a different kind of ship than all the other ships, and that they are more black ops. Um, because if you remember early in the first season, we got a glimpse at somebody's badge, and it was one of those Section right. 31 mm -hmm. badges. So I think that because of Discovery having that super special um, spore drive, Mm -hmm. That the ship itself is sort of a classified ship, and so everybody on it is privy to those classified things like Section 31, or at least the senior staff is, you know. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm so sick and tired of the mirror universe <laughs> that I'm kind of not looking forward to see. I do like Michelle Yeo. But I don't like that character. And so I'm kind of sick and tired of seeing the mirror universe impacting this universe in so many ways that are fundamental to the to that world that they're building, you know? Like, I just... I do not like that, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm happier that, that, that they're using that as a way, it looks like from the trailers, that they're using Section 31 as a way to reincorporate uh, Ash Tyler. Um, right. Now, but, go ahead. Yeah, but, I mean, but I would not have gone as far as bringing in Giorgio into Section 31. So. Now, the reason why I would ask, well, I mean, because... She's on that ship in a different uniform. Also, Tyler's in a different uniform. And it has kind of that the different badge comm sign. So, of course, everyone's going to then know that they're kind of like part of this. But um, there was a movie. Oh, people, shit. what was the name? It was Gilstein or something like, like two minor characters in Hamlet. They did a movie. Uh, Rosencrantz and Gilderstein. Thank are you. Dead. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. That Section 31 should be. Go back to the episodes that has already happened, or go behind the scenes to the stuff that we kind of know, but show them coming on a different angle to kind of make things happen, or behind the scenes to make things happen. I think that would have been a better way to go, other than now everyone on this ship knows this is who we are. We're part of Section 31 or something to that effect. Because I heard there was a mention of a, a ship, a, a portion of the bridge dedicated for Section 31. Mm. So I'm just kind of take yeah. that. I'm like, it's like Fight Club. You don't mention that we have a Fight Club. That's the first rule. You know? Right, but I mean, I have a feeling that that's going to be the justification for why we've never heard of Discovery before. That Discovery itself may be a classified ship, you know? Mm. Well, then you would that have... Then you have incorporated to, uh, into the actual history of Star Trek, you know? Well, then you have to delete that section from, you know, their history because, obviously, there's no mention of, of Burnham uh, with Spock right. and, and all that stuff. So I'm wondering, maybe Burnham finally gets, to ki gets killed. That's why. <laughs> Uh, who who knows? Um, I kind of liked the idea that as Pike, as a captain, um, he's a much better, tonally, a different character than, than Lorca. Not that I don't appreciate Lorca or a, a captain that kind of plays things loose and fast. But I like someone that has some regulations under him that he doesn't mind breaking them. I don't like someone who is willing to play it loose and fast, that kind of thing. And I'm like, 
it, it reminds me of this. Uh, I forgot the guy's name. Uh, but in the spin-off series for Babylon Five, there was a series called Crusade. Mm-hmm. So Crusade, uh, the ship and the captain had like a five-year mission to find the cure, which just sounds like something you just ripped out of the anime uh, Starship uh, Yamato uh, Star Blazers. Uh, but he had to do whatever he had to do in order to find a cure, and he didn't like the rules did not apply. So I'm like. Uh, I don't care for that kind of captain. If I'm going to follow someone into battle, I would follow Pike more than I would find uh, follow Lorca. You know, so I'm kind of happy. At least tonally, Pike is a much better captain than Lorca, even though for his faults, it wasn't even really him. But should we bring back Lorca at this point, or is that like, no, we're done? No, I'd like to see Lorca, but I'd like them to do the flip side of what they did with Giorgio. Like, I'd like them to end up finding the Lorca from this universe. Okay. Like, it turns out that the Lorca from this universe was not killed, and they find him, and then we get to know whether that guy is a good person or not, you know? Like, right. Um, I think that would be interesting. But, um... Yeah, I'm done with the Mary universe. I just do not want to deal with them anymore. All right. So, um, did you think that season two, the first episode, is an improvement over the first episode from the first season? Or is it just comparable? Or is it what? Was it comparable to the first episode for season one? No, I mean, I, I think that they're just different animals you know like I think that the one thing I had a problem with in the original season premiere the season one premiere was that the first two episodes seemed like they were just backstory before the actual story started like a prologue right and I probably would have skipped all that and just started with episode three yeah I would agree but this but this seems more like your traditional pilot where they're introducing all the elements, showing how they all work together. And then they're going to get into the season long arc, you know? Um, so I think this was more successful. Um, yeah. yeah. And it felt like a, it felt like a pretty nice reset. And it also, I like how they're branching out and exploring the, the second tier crew that we rarely get to see up close, you know, like mm-hmm. yeah. Lieutenant Pe- Commander Arium and Lieutenant Detmer, you know, those people, because they seem like interesting characters too. We just better get around to seeing who the chief medical officer is. I don't think we've met them, you know. Like, well, we did until uh, Tyler killed him. <laughs> Because he no, was. No, he was not the chief medical officer. He was just. No, I thought he was. No, he was. No, he was just an uh, assistant doctor. Like everybody is there. We no. haven't met the chief engineer either. Like Lieutenant Stamets is just an engineer there, but he's not the chief engineer. Mm. So here's another question: Have you watched the Orville? No, no. I refuse to watch that show. <laughs> but. Okay, then I don't have a question because I wanted to get your your opinion about between the two series. Um, so I, I mean, I'll, I will tell you that just because I like Star Trek does not mean I like Star Trek type shows. Like every time I've tried to sample one, mm-hmm. I have not liked it. Like I am not into Farscape. I'm not into. I'm just not into those shows, you know? I like Battlestar because Battlestar was different enough. And I liked uh, Firefly because it was different enough from the Star Trek premise. But Well, I would argue that... Orville, for, well, I would say Star Trek-like ahead. is definitely on that list. Uh, Orville is on that list, definitely. Whereas Farscape is not. I think you could appreciate Farscape for what it is. 
So if you get a chance, um, I would recommend well, Maybe that. I'll give that one a try. Yeah. Well, but definitely Orville, if it's something Star Trek-like, that's very Star Trek-like. Um, and that's the thing right. that I appreciated for season one. Um, even though it had kind of a weird mix of the humor, I enjoyed that more than the season one of Star Trek Discovery because Orville felt more like the Star Trek that I was more accustomed to. Not that I don't appreciate what they were trying to do on Discovery, but you had to explain a lot more things to me as a long, dedicated Star Trek fan, how, why do the Klingons now look like this? Is this now the new look? All right. And that took some time to get used to. The high-tech technology, this is how, you know, we're going to be doing it from now on. All ships have, like, more advanced technology than we used to see in the original series. Fine. I will go with that. But, again, Orville was his own thing, and it was easier to jump in right at the first glance as opposed to almost for me at the very end of season one before I even got even a, a liking to the show itself. Mm-hmm. So... The other thing that I was almost panicking right from the very beginning, I heard space that Burnham was saying, the final frontier, and I was shitting in my pants. I don't know, I was screaming. I'm like, no, do not do the opening. Do not do the goddamn opening. You don't deserve that. You're not anyone to do the space, the final frontier. You know, these are continuing voices. No, you don't get to do that. And I thank God it changed to, you know, she's telling about a story that she heard when she, about a girl in Africa and all that. But I freaked out right at the very beginning. Thank God it turned itself around. <laughs> Otherwise, I was almost ready to call it like I quit. You know, that was my only qualm about that. I had this initial knee jerk reaction. I almost wanted to punch that screen. Because she said word space. So, thankfully, it did not happen that way. So, other hey, than uh, that, Going yeah. back to something we were talking about earlier, the Section 31 show they want to spin off. Yes. Um, I have a feeling that you and I are not going to be as annoyed by it as we think. Because I have a feeling that it is not going to be produced as a open-ended series. I have a feeling that, you know, they just can't sign Michelle Yeo to be a regular on a show. So I have a feeling it's going to be a limited series, you know? Right. Which, if it is that, then I'll be a lot better about that. I'll feel a lot better about that than I would if it were a season-long, you know, series with multiple seasons, you know, like... Well, I, I think the other option, too, is that because you, we've known, we have known Section 31 uh, since, like, uh, Deep Space Nine was the first indication. And then we got that um, in the Star Trek Into Darkness movie, they played into that. There have been a couple of books that talked about Section 31. So it's always been out there, and I think you have enough room that we don't know a hell of a lot about what goes on with Section 31. So it's okay, and you can run whatever direction you want to go through. But when you have Star Trek Discovery stuck as a, a starship, then you have to know when is this timeline and where is it taking place in relation to the original series or the next generation or Voyager. So that's the, the problem that Star Trek Discovery had as opposed to a new series like Section 31. No, we can do whatever because we don't know anything. Now, the thing with Picard, uh, we're hearing that it's not going to be the same Picard that we've known, but I'm thinking that it's, and again, this is something that I've, I've argued about the Kelvin timeline. And I'm sure they're not going to talk about this, but if the Kelvin timeline existed through Next Generation, that if there was a Picard and the Next Generation and all that, 
that Picard would not be the same Picard that we have known all those years. So if that's the route they go, I'm kind of on board with that. If not, i like to know why is he not the happy-go-lucky, you know, Jean-Luc waiter uh, moment from the uh, International Coffee commercial that we all loved and learned so over the years. Mm-hmm. So I'm eager for that, uh, for all that to come out, especially on the heels that Star Trek Four is not going to happen. So I'm kind of bummed, at least on the big screen, but at least, you know, for right now, we're getting a lot more Star Trek than we've had, I think, in many years. You know, because we always had maybe one or two series running concurrently, but to have, you know, maybe three or four running at the exact same time, that's amazing. So do you think that's overkill, or is that, no, we need that? No, I mean, I, I I don't want fifty Star Treks on at the same time. Right. You know, like, I think that you know, like, I think this stems from something I heard one of the CBS executives said when season one of Discovery was over. They said we would always like to have some Star Trek show on the air year round right and so I think that that's what they're going for but I don't need one on the air all the time like I feel like less is more right um as a kid I might have wanted that but I think the execution of it there's a lot of potential for overkill you know like um now would you keep it still all on CBS All Access or would you throw one bone to the fans and say, you know, we'll give you this series for TV, everything else? You have no, to I mean, I mean, why not keep it on CBS All Access? Because now it's become like destination TV with Discovery. So it's like if you're in for a penny, in for the pound, just put them all on there. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Eventually, they'll have enough that they can have a dedicated Star Trek channel the way DC Universe has its own channel, you know? Like, because there's already more than 500 episodes of the thing, you know? What so, would you? And then if they if they have five series running at the same time, they'll get, they'll squeeze another 200 out pretty quick, you know? So, would you do that? Would you actually pay for another streaming service? Even though we've seen all the episodes and own maybe most of them, you would still do this or like, no, nah, it's all right. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, eventually, I feel like everything is going to be so niche; it's going to be its own streaming. You know? No, I know. It's like the Disney Plus. You know that. Look, it, I don't want to see the animated movies that I've just owned over the years that I've seen all my life. Now I'm going to have to pay right. just to stream it. No, I want new content on this channel. And thankfully, you know, Marvel is getting in the way of uh, multiple programming. But I, I can't see, like, this is just all Star Trek all the time. Unless you do something different for me to get into. Like, you know, DC is smart enough knowing that there is so much content that has been produced over the years, whether it's the animated series, the directed DVD series, the TV series that happened over the years, plus the movies over the years, then I can say, yeah, you have enough diversity within that brand to kind of do this. But if it's just Star Trek, I can do that by myself. I don't need a separate brand uh, streaming service, so to speak. So, but, you know, stranger things have happened before. I mean, other, like, I forget which other, I think, not Sony, but our WB is doing their own stuff, and I'm like, it, it, now is it going to be to the point that, like, there has to be a cutoff point. Like, you're too late to enter to, into that game because it's going to wind up costing people more than what we had for cable, you know? Well, uh, no, but I mean, it's the free market. I think that what will happen is you'll get a hundred of these niche channels and then they, 
like a lot of them will realize that they're not sustainable right by themselves they'll they'll disappear and whatever their programming is will probably get absorbed into another streaming show right. yeah um, I'll see yeah I said I feel that what the Star Trek Picard series will do will be interesting but you know the other the other shows seem a little bit like filler you know right now um, would you want to have other cast members show up for Picard or like no Picard's good enough for us to uh, delve into I mean I think he's interesting enough that he could fill out the whole show by himself but it would be cool to see somebody from time to time so that you know it's still the same world, you know? Like, right. And I feel like they plan on doing that, but it just... They'll be used more as spice than drivers of the... Right. You know, main drivers of the show, you know? Yeah. Okay. So, Tony, we've actually spent a lot more time talking about this than I expected, but thank you. I really appreciate your time to help me uh, talk about Starship Discovery. So, Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. I appreciate you inviting me on your show. And uh, when the series for Season 2 is over, we're definitely going to come back and do a whole big wrap-up like we did in the past year. Uh, talking about yeah, Season 1. Yeah, that'd be one. great. Okay, so this is going to be the end of our podcast. I want to thank Tony for joining me on today's podcast. Again, you can visit him at cinemaviewfinder.com. You can always email me at monstersci-fi-show at gmail.com. You can follow me on the various social networks. Thank you for listening to me and to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. It's sci-fi from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.